Uh, welcome, my fellow geothermal students. Jonathan Bo here, looking at week 15 or topic 15 now. Um, let's continue with uh, some more of this, uh, the fullerenes, the Buckminster fullerenes, because we're going to find that that this prevails, this uh, basic hexagonal or um, icosahedronic form turns into a whole bunch of other good stuff. So let's take a look at, get a little more information on the, uh, from Goldfinder here on nanotechnology or nanotech buckyballs, nanotubes, nanofibers. For a long time, it was assumed that carbon could exist in two crystal structures, diamond and graphite, and one amorphous form, pseudo-carbon black. carbon was not even imagined before 1985. In 1985, Professor Sir Harry Croteau, at Sussex, Robert Carl, and Richard Smalley of Rice, discovered new group of molecules, entirely made up of carbon atoms. They called it furine. Fullerene. You might remember that that's because of Buckminster Fuller. They call it fullerene, and here's that soccer ball that we were looking at in our last lecture, uh, up in uh, lecture three, topic 14. The molecule is entirely made up of carbon atoms, and exists in various shapes. These carbon atoms arrange themselves to form cage-like structures, of hollow sphere, ellipsoid, or tube. A. 60 carbon atoms combine to form hollow sphere-like structure, indicated by C60. B. 70 carbon atoms form ellipsoidal structure, indicated by C70. Uh, C70, uh, also the uh, atomic interstice, or these, you remember the little bonds he called them? Uh, the way you get this to flattening or ellipsoidal form is by stretching, that's what they call a zafu, and it's, uh, you, st you stretch the, the hexagonal bonds or strut members here. Same thing you can do when you build your geodesics in uh, full scale. C. If a sheet of carbon atoms is rolled into a cylinder, then it forms a tube-like structure, called nanotube. Notice that the nanotube is comprised completely of hexagons. So the curvature here is created by the, the uh, relationship of the pentagons. So it's, and you see there's a pentagon right here too in the ellipsoidal form. And a pentagon right here. And it's all based in the icosahedron, uh, tw basic 20-sided uh, triangular, triangular faced uh, shape. <laughs> Besides C60, C70 and nanotubes, there are infinite number of fullerenes possible. Depend other topics in this section are, why does carbon form allotropes? What are allotropes? How was fullerene discovered? Study of fullerene from C20 up to C720. Bond structure, hybridization and crystal structure, properties of buckyball, application of buckyball. tubes or nanotubes, single-walled nanotubes. The structure of a single-walled nanotube can be conceptualized by wrapping a one atom thick layer of graphite, called graphene, into a seamless cylinder. start to think about what good is this going to do us in geothermal, uh, well, uh, the, the bucky tubes or nanotubes can be used to conduct electricity or seismo, uh, you know, micro seismicity. So you can hear what's going on underground. You can, uh, we'll, we'll also see how these uh, tubes can be used to conduct uh, 
uh, not only electrical impulses but sound as well. <laughs> Synthesis. Fullerenes are generally produced by three main techniques. 1. Electric arc discharge. 2. Laser ablation. 3. Chemical vapor deposition. Properties of nanotubes. of bunker tubes. Medical application of punch. So at the time that this was produced evidently they didn't uh, they weren't aware of the the, the uh, nano uh, technology required for the uh, to create the matrix for cold fusion to create the uh, limiting matrix for the cold fusion process, which is, you know, based in uh, the fullerenes also. Evolve. Hey, there you have it. A look at buckyballs, nanotubes nanofibers some pretty good stuff now how will geo or nanotechnology change the world and we'll skim through the, you, know, you can look at this whole thing if you'd like but we're going to get some highlights out of here Imagine a world with buildings that can ride out earthquakes, bacteria that make gasoline, tiny devices that repair individual cells, even DNA, gossamer threads strong enough to hold up a bridge or an elevator to the stars. These visions of the future are based in the discoveries of today as a new science of materials emerges from the elemental building blocks of the universe, promising a future in which we can create virtually anything we want, atom by atom. I'm David Pogue, and I'm on a quest to discover how the world's smallest materials are changing our lives. Swarms of nanomachines that combat cancer on the cellular level with bee venom. Bee venom is a cancer drug? Yes, yeah, an excellent cancer drug. Computer chips one atom thick and up to a thousand times faster than silicon chips today. Come on. Now you're hurting my brain. Oh. <laughs> this capsule is acquiring images at a rate of two frames per second. And high definition cameras an inch long, monitoring our bodies from within. Oh man, I think I just banged the top of the eyeball. How far can we go? That's a robot? That's a robot. In making stuff smaller right now on Nova go the first flat screens cost as much as twelve thousand dollars they had thick glass panels and weighed a whopping 85 pounds but now this TV is 0.3 inches deep are you kidding <laughs> The nice thing is when they FedEx it to you, they can just slip it under the door. Exactly. I'm on a quest to discover why size matters. Why getting smaller leads to such gigantic benefits. Performance on it is phenomenal in low light. You have F2.8 lens, 24 millimeter wide. It's just a great piece. It's crazy. If everything we own had improved over the last 25 years as much as electronics have, the average family car would travel four times faster than the space shuttle. Houses would cost 200 bucks. What's the secret behind electronic stunning advances? How many times have I reviewed these and wondered exactly what's inside there? Do you mind if I, if I have a look? No, not at all. I, I'd like to have a look inside. Yeah, please do.
where I come from, if you want to know how something works, you cut it open. Sony versus saw. Here we go. You guys are standing far enough back because I would not want anyone to get hurt. <laughs> what do you think we'll find? Elves? Butterflies? <laughs> and now, let's see what really is on the inside of a digital camera. Not much, really. And no moving parts at all. This digital camera... This is the brains. ...runs on a half-inch wide microchip. So, it seems like if this is really the heart of the camera, a lot of it just exists so that I can handle it with my big human hands. Correct. Because that's not exactly the most comfortable form factor you want to be using right there. <laughs> I know. Honey, smile. Come on, let me see you smile. Come on. This tiny wafer contains a highly sophisticated machine. What's it made of? A computer chip is like a densely packed city. A solid slab of silicon sprinkled with other elements like boron and arsenic, topped by layers of metals and ceramics. They're laid out like tiny functional neighborhoods. Over here is memory. 50 years ago, you'd have needed a whole building full of vacuum tubes to store just a fraction of what fits in here. Over here is where data comes in and out of the chip. 50 years ago, the fastest computer on Earth could process maybe a few hundred punch cards a minute. Today, data goes in and out billions of times faster. And here is the processor. 50 years ago, a computer could add a few thousand numbers in a second. In that same amount of time, this tiny chip can perform billions of calculations. Scientists have discovered that the secret to cheap computing power is size. When we find the right materials and make them small, they change the world. That is, it's a completely different material interaction. Very cool. They use the same samarium cobalt material and magnetic fields to set them in motion. So it's literally like drilling its way through that it's liquid. Drilling its way up. Wow. This is the biggest one. The smallest one is only 30 microns long. That's 30 millionths of a meter, about a third the width of a human hair. So now, just in the last few years, we've actually been able to build small things of a similar size and shape to, to real bacteria that swim just like they do, potentially deep inside a person's body. The magnet-driven robots in Brad's lab, the iBot, the FlagellaBot, and even a soccer-playing robot that his students created, are each no bigger than a dust speck. Brad's learned to modify his robots to overcome the physical obstacles in the microscopic realm. But he's only scratched the surface of the strange properties in that infinitesimal world. An atom is actually a fraction of an nanometer. Chad Merkin is an explorer and pioneer in this weird realm, the nano world. You keep saying you're building things on the nanometer scale. I don't, I don't even know what a nanometer is. So, so this is a meter, this is a centimeter, this is a millimeter. Is this a nanometer? What's a nanometer? Let me try to illustrate it for you. If we shrink you by a factor of two, you're about the size of a small child. We continue to shrink you by a factor of two four more times, you're about the size of a golf ball. We go to 10, you're now the size of an ant. We keep going another seven times, and now you're about the diameter of a human hair. That's roughly what we can see with the naked eye. Even after so much shrinking, I'm not even close to the nanoscale. Cut me in half five more times, and I'm the size of a red blood cell. Five more times, I'm a virus. Seven more times, and I'm finally one nanometer in size one billionth of a meter. That's less than half the width of DNA. It seems unimaginable that we might harness materials this small, but in fact, it's not all that new. People have been using nanotechnology almost unknowingly uh, for centuries. For example, back in the Middle Ages, when stained glass windows were made, they were using tiny little particles to get the beautiful colors. You simply need to go to Canterbury Cathedral and you can see the effects of nanotechnology in the beautiful glass windows. Canterbury Cathedral, 
Some of the stained glass in here is nearly a thousand years old. With so much history under one roof, it's no surprise that the cathedral needs a full-time staff of glass preservationists. So this is the, the paint station. This is like my local Home Depot with different <laughs> swatches, right? It's a little bit like that, yes. This is Leonie Seliger, the head restorer at the cathedral. I've come in search of ancient nanotech secrets. Um, what we're looking at here are stains. The stain gets fired, so it's, it's like a pottery glaze. It's fused onto the surface of the glass. Okay. The trouble is that you don't just paint a yellow color on glass and you know how deep and how rich it is. You have to use a chemical process. So to make yellow, you mix silver with clay. Hmm. Silver under heat actually produces a yellow glass. Wow. She's using silver chloride, which in its natural form looks like small silvery crystals. Leone mixes a tiny amount with red clay. It's a silver salt that is mixed with this clay. I you can't you. see it. You, what you see is the clay. OK, OK. You would then paint that on. I've made a little series here where I've now applied this clay. And after it's fired, if I then wipe that off, and hey, presto. Oh, look at that. From silver clay comes a golden color. There's some kind of voodoo chemistry going on there for sure. That's the mystery. Somehow, this is nanotechnology at work. In the heating process, the silver crystals break down into tiny nanoparticles and turn yellow. But it only works on this glass. And that's not all. Leone assures me that there are several other metals used in stained glass where nanotech creates surprising color results. Copper would give you... Um, Brown. Or red. Red? Mm. Or green. That's just bizarre. Gold gives you beautiful, rich pink glass, even rich ruby glass. And, and why is that? Why is something that we think of as gold, why does it come out red? Ask a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> it's magic. It's it is a bit. I mean, in the Middle Ages, of course, Oxidation. it was always a closely guarded secret on yeah. what makes what the color, at which temperature. When artists first learned how to change the colors of metals, it must have seemed like the potential for nanotechnology, the improvements, and even pico technology now, which is uh, you know even smaller, huh? ten to the minus twelfth, as opposed to ten to the minus ninth, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Here we go. So one billionth, one trillionth, and they're starting to develop uh, pico processes uh, within the nano sphere so who knows what's next right stay tuned